Diane Nelson is fine. Good morning. Welcome to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Dr. German Sidhu. Um, I'm a chief resident here at uh, ETSU Psychiatry. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Diane Nelson. Um, she has gotten her education at the University of Tennessee, uh, bachelor's, bachelor's of Science in Natural Sciences, followed by MS and a PhD in Zoology. Um, she's um, had quite a career. Um, she's worked at um, NSF initially in her um, life and then followed by NASA. And then she's been here at ETSU since 1968. So we really appreciate her coming over and giving us this lecture. So please give her a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I've been at ETSU all my life, it seems. So, and I'm still at ETSU. I've retired about three or four times, and I'm still there. So uh, today I have the pleasure of coming to talk to you about a subject that's very dear to my heart. And I thank all of you for coming today, and especially to Dr. Goodkin for the invitation to come and talk to you about NAMI today. Uh, my name is Diane Nelson. And I'm a volunteer for NAMI. And some of you may not have heard of NAMI. I'm associated with NAMI of Johnson City. We consider this to be the best kept secret that we have in Washington County. Because who has ever heard of NAMI? Uh, most people, well, some of you have. That's great. That's wonderful. And NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And our goal and our mission is to provide people with education and support and, well, excuse me, I got off here, here we, here we go. To provide you with education and support and advocacy and to provide research. We have a lot of uh, grassroots action going on where we have volunteers that go to the legislature and our day on the Hill will be on March the 6th. And people from NAMI across the state of Tennessee will go and talk to our legislators about what the needs are for people that are diagnosed with mental illness. And most of the legislators have no idea about mental illness and certainly no idea about NAMI. And where NAMI got started was, again, a grassroots action and it was two women that were sitting in their kitchen and talking about what can we do to help our families who have mental illness. Now this was about 30 years ago when NAMI first got started. They were the original NAMI mommies, so they got it all started. And since then we've grown to a nationwide organization of about 300,000 families. And that's just a fraction of those that need to know about NAMI and need to be able to get the support that we can offer. And so you wonder, why is NAMI still unknown? Why don't more people know about what's going on? Oops, wrong button. I think a battery died. 
going to do it here from here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There's always technical problems. So why is NAMI still unknown? And the problem is, is because when mental illness strikes, the first reaction is one of chaos. A lot of fear is involved. Isolation, and particularly shame. So people are ashamed of having family members that are mentally ill. They're ashamed of being mentally ill themselves. And that's because of the tremendous amount of stigma that's associated with mental illness. And that prevents families and individuals from seeking help. And sometimes when they do, they're met with silence. And so they're totally frustrated. They don't know where to turn. Nobody tells them anything. And so they have to try to dig out the resources on their own. Now, I was introduced to NAMI because my sister, Linda, was diagnosed with mental illness. And her husband deserted her down in Florida in 2004. And she, was, she had a psychotic break at that point. And she was in a crisis center down there for a few days. And I flew down to Florida to see what was going on. And they said, well, we can't take care of her here. You have to find a place for her to live. She was diabetic. She had uh, learning disabilities from the time she was born. So she didn't know how to deal with the numbers of diabetes. She didn't know how to write them down. She was dyslectic. She would get the numbers backwards. And so I found a place for her, assisted living place in, in Florida. And... At that point, she was getting worse and worse and worse because there was no diagnosis and there was no treatment. So she was having hallucinations. She was having delusions. She thought everybody was out to get her. She was actually having grand mal seizures that were induced by mental illness. So I brought her up to Johnson City. I finally got a place for her at Pine Oaks Assisted Living. And... What I did not know is the doctors down in Florida had put her on a, a mild dose of Stelazine. And when I got her up here, she was so relieved to be safe and have a place to live and have food and have her medications given to her that she was ecstatic and she went into the mania stage of bipolar disorder. And they thought she was wonderful. She was the little social butterfly. She liked to talk to everybody. Uh, she was younger than everybody else in assisted living because she was only 62 years old. And so she hung out with the nurses and the CNAs and not with the residents because, you know, they were old and she didn't consider herself old. And this is a picture of my sister in 2002. And she had been a hairdresser, so she liked to have her hair done. She liked to have her makeup on. She liked wearing her jewelry. She was a social butterfly, and everybody loved her. And then one day, she came out of her little room there with one of her stuffed animals on her shoulder, and her whole demeanor had changed. Her affect had changed. And she didn't want to talk to anybody, and she didn't want to eat what they were serving, and she decided it had cocaine in it. So it wasn't safe for her to eat. And they didn't know what was going on. So I came over and I talked to her and I tried to understand what was happening. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know about mental illness. I didn't know what her diagnosis was because nobody had ever diagnosed her. And then one day she decided that she wasn't getting any service. And so she took everything in her little room, her apartment, and threw it in the middle of the floor and jumped up and down on it and broke cans and broke bottles and broke glass and cut her feet and cut her hands and she told them that I did it. And they said, you've got to do something with your sister. So I said, okay, let's send her to um, Houston Valley. They have a Jerry Psych unit. Took her over there 
and they ask her questions like, and I'm sure you're familiar with these questions, do you hear anything that, uh, that other people don't hear? She said no, but she thought everybody could hear what she could hear because she told the nurses, you hear those helicopters up there sending me messages? She thought they could hear it. And they asked her, do you see things that other people don't see? Well, that was a dumb question because she thought you could see the snake that was in the TV. So she said no. They kept her for three days and they let her go. They said there's nothing wrong with her. She's perfectly fine. As soon as we got her out of the hospital, back in the car, she started having more and more behaviors and getting out of control. Took her back to Pine Oaks and she had more incidences of behavior. She actually ran away from the facility and we had to go get her and bring her back. So I tried another Jerry Psych unit and put her in one in Sycamore Shoals. And they kept her three days and said she was fine and sent her back. And by this time she was paranoid about going back to Pine Oaks. So in desperation, I sent her to Woodridge. I didn't know where else to go. And Woodridge wouldn't let her bring her little stuffed animal that was her therapy dog. And I thought, well, how are they gonna help her? Well, she had Dr. Houghton. And Dr. Rod Houghton kept her for six weeks. And he called TenCare every three days and kept her. He tried every medication, all of the new medications, and finally said, Let's try something old. They put her on Clozaril, and she stabilized. She stabilized. She was back to being my sister. She was back to being the social butterfly. And there were some breakthroughs that occurred. She had several cases where she had UTIs, because by now she was in a nursing home because she had lost control of her balance. Uh, she couldn't take care of herself. so. I was fortunate to get her in a nursing home at, in Elizabethan when she was 64 years old. And for the last 12 years, they took excellent care of her. And she died on October the 13th. But every time she went to the hospital, the first thing they would do was to take her off of her Clozaril. And when they did that, she would go through Clozaril withdrawal, and then the symptoms would start coming back. They would, they would cure her of the pneumonia. They would cure her of the UTI, but they'd send her back with no Clozaril, and we'd start over again. And so we had several cases of going back to the hospital and back to the hospital and starting over again with the Clozaril. And finally I said, no more hospitals, just keep her on the Clozaril. If she gets sick, we'll just treat her here. And so they did, and she was happy. The day she died, she was singing and saying, tomorrow is Sunday and my sissy's coming to get me and we're going for pizza. So she had a very good life. The last 12 years of her life were probably the best years of her life. And so I'm very thankful, one, that she got a diagnosis and two, that she got the right medication that kept her going. But that's when I found NAMI because when I went to Woodridge, to see my sister for the first time since she had been hospitalized there. There was a representative from NAMI who came and told me that NAMI had support groups. And I said, what? I didn't know there was an organization called NAMI. I didn't know there was support for me, that there was support for my sister. And so I found NAMI and then it has been a resource, not only for me, but for hundreds of other people in the Tri-Cities. I've been on the helpline call. People call me at home and they say, I'm having problems with my sister, I'm having problems with my son, I'm having problems with my mother. In fact, about a month ago, a woman came and I was telling her how NAMI gave support, and she said, I don't need a support group. I need somebody to come and get my crazy ass mother out of here and take her away. And so that, that's the frustration that families feel because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to take care of their loved one. Now NAMI does not prescribe. 
We don't say, your kid needs to take Clozaril or your kid needs to take Geodon. We don't tell them which psychiatrist to go to. We offer them support. We ask them, what have you done that has worked? What have you done that has not worked? What are some things that you might be willing to try? And so we try to support them and tell them, you go here in order to find out about housing for your son, because he can't live on his own. You go here to find out about getting uh, assistance. For example, they were arrested because of shoplifting. My sister shoplifted down in Florida because her husband told her to, because he was a drug runner, and he told her to shoplift. And so they were in a store, and she picked up some cigarettes for him. And of course, she got arrested along with him. And she cried continuously until they just let her out, because they couldn't stand the crying that was going on. But she didn't know that she wasn't supposed to shoplift. She would do anything that Ricky told her to do. So NAMI doesn't try to solve the problem for the person. We don't take the place of the doctors and the nurses, the professionals. We try to support the families. But this presentation is so important because, oh, let's try this one. Not sure why it's not working. Those people need help. The families need help. But you may not know that NAMI provides crucial information to families that are affected by mental illness. NAMI serves as their advocate on the local level, on the state level, and on the national level. We have national conventions, we have state conventions, we have local meetings, we have local affiliates. But we have to break the silence. We have to dispel the stigma that affects mental illness. So only then, if we can break the stigma, can we get people to step forward and to get the help that they need. So what's it like to live with a broken brain? Hallucinations are the number one things that occur. Now, you probably don't hallucinate. But sometimes you may have seen something out of the corner of your eye and thought something was there, and then you looked, and there wasn't anything there. What if that happened to you all the time? Sometimes you may be alone, and you may hear somebody call your name, and you look, and you realize, oh, nobody's here. But what if that happened to you all the time, every day? and you couldn't get that out of your head. What if you ha thought of a song? You know how sometimes a song gets stuck in your brain and you can't think of anything else and you try to get that song out of your mind? Like, I hate to say it, baby shark, doot, 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 doot. That's gonna be with you the rest of the day. But you can get over baby shark, doot, 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 doot. I don't know if I can or not, but, but a person that has mental illness hears that going through their brain all the time. It's like a radio inside their head that's constantly talking to them, that's singing their name. And you may have woken up sometime in the morning and said, oh, I don't want to go to work today. I don't want to go to school today. I think I'll just take a day off. Well, what if that happened to you every day? You didn't want to get out of bed. You didn't want to go to work. You didn't want to go to school. You just wanted to lay there and sleep. You didn't really want to eat, or sometimes you wanted to eat all the time. You couldn't stop eating. That happens to these people 
all the time. They don't want to get up. They don't want to go to work. They certainly do not want to clean house. And so often if they're living in the housing facility, they don't know how to take care of it. So what if you were afraid that you told, if you told somebody, they wouldn't hear you, they wouldn't listen? What if you thought that they wouldn't care? Now, fortunately, we've learned a lot about mental illness because we've learned a lot about the brain. And we know now with some of the new technologies that have been developed that there is a difference in the brain between a normal person and a person who has mental illness. This has helped us to understand that mental illness is a brain disorder. It's a damaged brain that you're dealing with. It's not something that somebody can get over simply because of willpower, simply because somebody tells them, you just need to straighten up, or you just need to go out and get a job, or you just need to do whatever. Don't they get tired of hearing, you just need to do this? But you know that there is no shame in having mental illness. It's a brain disorder, just like there's no shame in having cancer. There is shame in living in a society where people are afraid to ask for the help that they need. You know that having a brain disorder is no different from having cancer or diabetes, and we don't say to people, oh, you have cancer, just get over it. What you need to do is just to go out and have fun. You know that the sooner the mental illness is diagnosed, the better off that person will be. The better the treatment that they will get the better the outcome that they will have. You know that these are not dumb people. In fact, many people with mental illness have a very high intelligence. And you can think of writers and entertainers and artists and entrepreneurs that have had mental illness and have been very successful. And people with mental illness can be very successful. You already know that the emotions that people feel are normal emotions, but they go to the extreme, and they can't control those emotions. So what do we need? We need you to break the stigma, to help NAMI break through that stigma. But we have to know what stigma is. Stigma is simply a mark of shame or disgrace. It starts when people are la labeled as being different from us, and it's us or them. When people are thought to be less than, stigma is prejudice. When people are thought to be uh, not given the same chances as other people, stigma is discrimination. It's not only the, the family with mental illness, the person with mental illness that suffers from stigma, but it's the whole family. When I was 10 years old, I learned that I had an aunt that I never knew that I had. She was in Lakeshore Mental Institution in Knoxville, and she escaped one day, and they called my mother, and my mother got very upset and said, no one can know about this. Don't tell anybody at school. I didn't even know I had an aunt. She had schizophrenia. So the whole family needs to know how to deal with this, how can we eliminate this discrimination and misinformation? And we need you to help us with that. Because you have direct access to the patients, you have direct access to the patients' families. And you can help us break that stigma. You can help us to help them know that it's a brain disorder. It's not a matter of moral failure that they have this mental illness. What can you do? You can attend a NAMI presentation. We have meetings on the second Thursday of the month at Harrison Christian Church, 2517 uh, Browns Mill Road at 7 p.m. Second Thursday of the month. Come to a presentation. Volunteer to lead a presentation. So you can tell the families what's new in medications. You can tell the families what new services are available for them. You can help us educate the people about mental illness. 
Now we do offer a number of education programs. One of them is called NAMI Basics, and that's for children and adolescents. So we have a program where we can go to a middle school and talk to kids about mental illness so that they will learn not to stigmatize other children in their classes that have problems. Or they may learn about mental illness and realize that mother's problem is mental illness and not because she's just mean. We have a, a great program, Family to Family, where we have people like myself who are family members of those with a mental illness, and we teach other family members about mental illness. We even have somebody from the College of Pharmacy that comes and talks to that class about medications and helps them to understand what are the new medications, how do they work, what are the old medications, what are the problems with those. Uh, and we have a brochure here about our NAMI affiliate here in Johnson City, and inside is the NAMI phone number to call, and also the phone number of one of our NAMI members named Sherry. Uh, the one, well, actually Sherry's number is no longer working. She has a new number, which is not in the brochure, but there's another number there for Shelby, and there's a 1-800 number that you can call, and those calls usually come to me, and then I tell them about our meeting and where to come. So please take one of these brochures, either here from the front desk or from the back desk as you go out. We also have a program for, called Homefront, and this is for military people and their veterans. Uh, Shelby, that I mentioned, whose phone number is there, is a military mom. Her husband was in the military. She has two children that have mental illness who are in the military, have retired from the military. So we also have brochures about different NAMI, uh, about different um, disorders, and these brochures are produced by NAMI and they are factual, they are correct. So this one is on understanding bipolar disorder and recovery. And we concentrate on recovery ed education. We have peer-to-peer -peer where we have somebody like uh, Teresa who is a bipolar person who is stabilized on medication and she does peer-to-peer -peer education. Because if someone with mental illness can talk to someone else on, that has mental illness and see that they are doing well on medication and they have a life, then it helps them to understand that they can also have a life. So education is a big for focus of our program. And we do presentations like I'm doing here today we have one that we do in schools for middle and high school students about ending the silence. So trying to get people more comfortable to talk about mental illness. We have a program that's called In Our Own Voice, where people like Teresa with bipolar disorder and other NAMI members talk to the ETSU nursing students every year, every fall class, gets this program In Our Own Voice so that they can learn when they go through the training for mental illness what can be done, and there's a lot that can be done. We have other presentations for Latino families or for African American families. Next week I'm going to King University and I'll give a presentation there to the student athletes because they realize that student athletes suffer from depression and anxiety and their suicide rate is too high. And so we're trying to educate more people about NAMI and about mental illness and about recovery. So this 1-800 number gets you to the NAMI helpline and then they will, that will get you to someone that you can actually physically talk to on the phone. Uh, there's also the website for NAMI which is simply NAMITennessee.org, or for the national organization, it's NAMI.org. We have a Facebook page for NAMI Johnson City, so go to Facebook, like our page, and we will say, you know, what programs we're having coming in, you know, for the month of February. February is going to be a support meeting. So people know then that we will have two support groups, one for family members that go into one room, one for those that have a diagnosis of mental illness and they're in another room. 
so they meet at the same time but in different rooms so that things can be openly spoken about. And then we come back together. We have a big Christmas dinner every year where we give the, the group homes that have mental illness, we give them a big Christmas dinner. We take those residents out to Shoney's for a big Christmas breakfast during that time. We, in the summer, we have a big picnic so people from group homes can come and the families and those that have mental illness can talk to each other. So we really try to do a lot. But most of us in the organization, because we have come into this when we were adults, most of us now are in our 70s. We need some people that are in their 40s or 50s to come and help contribute to NAMI Tennessee, to NAMI Johnson City, to be a volunteer, to help us with various things, to give us some guidance on things. So there's a lot you can do to help the community. There's a lot that you can do to help NAMI so that NAMI can help the community. So I'm open to questions. If anybody has questions that you would like to ask. And I should tell you that this is a picture of my sister last Christmas at my house where she had a huge Christmas celebration. And she was so, so happy because she got so much jewelry. Everybody gave Linda bracelets and necklaces. So she was really happy. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, for undergrads, uh, to come to the meetings, and you can, even as an undergrad, you can find out about what goes on in a NAMI meeting. You can talk to family members and find out what kind of assistance they need. You can help with the Christmas dinner, you can help with the breakfast, you can help with the picnics. We have a NAMI newsletter. I send it out to, by email to anybody that wants to be on the email list so that they get a newsletter every month that tells them not only what's going on with NAMI, but there's also a column that's written by a mental health nurse practitioner who writes a column for us about mental health. It has really good information. We send out a printed newsletter to 340 people every month. We need people to help put the seals on there and the labels on there to take them to the post office. And so those, there are things that can be done. Yes. Hi, right, Diane. Could you say anything about how NAMI coordinates with NIMH and SAMHSA around stigma and other issues as well? Yes, there's a great deal of coordinations with uh, NIH, with uh, Stigma Busters, with other mental health uh, organizations like Bring Change to Mind. So they share information, they share programs. So the more people, the better. We, we're not in competition with any other groups. We try to coordinate with those groups. Thank you. Well, let me ask you, have any of you had any experience with mental illness in a family member? So you've had some experience with that. You know what that is like. And you know how hard it was to get information. How hard it was to understand, what do I do? How can I help this person? When sometimes you just want to smack them up the side of the head and say, can't you just behave? And they can't. So you have the understanding, you have the empathy. Help us to let other people know about that. Okay. Well, I wanted to say something. Um, well, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you know, working in the outpatient clinics, we always need, you know, these types of groups to refer patients to and their family members. And in fact, I know in the past I've, you know, asked other people because I didn't know, yeah. you know, and it's been under our nose the whole time. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad, you know, this, this is good awareness for us residents, um, you know, to have an outlet to send our patients and family members to. That would be excellent because you have direct contact. You can say there is a group here in Johnson City that offers support, offers education, provides resources, 
and that would help us a lot and would help them. And especially for the family members, you know, that are new to mental illness, you know, they're often overwhelmed, uh, yes. you know, in taking care of their loved ones. So right. this, is, this is a great venue for them. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you all very much.